Walk us through the, the business a bit about what we're doing and why it's a, it's a good business. And then what I'll do is I'll talk some time about the technology. Um, and this should be open form, so if you've got any questions, just go right ahead and throw them out, right? So um, I've loaded more tech in, in on this presentation than usually I do, because most of the time um, we raised our first money, it's in the bank. Um, most of the time I'm talking to people who don't have the technical depth or don't need the technical depth. So this has got a lot, a lot more tech in it. Um, so we're focused on waterborne pathogens. So our mission is to commercialize systems, especially multi-pathogen testing systems, such that the water agencies out there that take care of the water that goes down your pipe, all those water agencies can improve the health. They can reduce the amount of sickness that is in the water. They can, do, they can do a better job of monitoring the environmental impact of waterborne pathogens. And around the world, especially in um, resource poor environments, that the number of fatalities out there directly related to waterborne pathogens can be reduced. Um, so, why don't we take a look at, at, at kind of when we say that, that waterborne pathogens are a problem, let's kind of, kind of maybe draw that together. So when, when you look at it, you can look at things like what you see in the newspaper, things like in developing countries, what, one and a half million children die every year. A child dies every like 25 seconds based on death from diarrhea that they get from bad water. Even though in the developed countries, um, billions are spent treating water and testing water, still hundreds of millions of dollars of hospital bills can be directly traced by the CDC to waterborne packages in water. The other piece that's going on is, is, is not this sort of a, a world problem with clean water. It has to do with the fact that the ecosystem of these pathogens is changing. They're evolving. And some of these pathogens that we've known about for a long time, the sporting majority, for example, has become resistant to chlorine. And they've all got, they got a name for it. They call it emerging pathogens. So now we not only have the problem of, of trying to do a better job of making sure there aren't waterborne pathogens in the water uh, that not only goes on the pipes but goes in the bottles, but now there's emerging pathogens. When you look at how that affects our, our customers, which are the water agencies, they've got a growing demand for what they're doing. The population's growing, they've got um, emerging pathogens, and the technology they're now using is just too slow. So straight ahead approach to analyzing that and all steam sort of sharp says that how do I get from one solution? I've got a problem that if I now do a standard, if I go to the East Bay Mud and do a water test, it takes 18 hours to get an answer, but the water's flowing for all that time. Right? I've already mentioned the fact we've got emerging pathogens that are resistant to chlorine. The problem is the tech that is better at it is very, very, very expensive. The amount of money they spend for one of those pathogen tests at East Bay Mud is about 20 bucks. The amount of money it takes to do a test for one of these emerging pathogens like Cryptosporium and Giardia is $600. And it doesn't take 24 hours, it takes 96 hours. So one solution is needed. Um, the system that we have here today um, is a result of what you call a technical arbitrage. So our system is able to turn uh, a sample around in three hours. It'll be able to look at up to 30 pathogens at one time. And it was specifically designed to be low cost and simple and, and rugged. <clears throat> so when you look at the, the markets and the segments and the trends that's going around with these businesses, our business is selling printers and cartridges to water agencies. These are, these are, these are test labs. So when you look at it, you have to look at the water, test and, uh, water pathogen test market, about $300 billion in 2013. In the U.S., it's about 140. It breaks up 120 in Europe and, and 40 in Asia. So that's how the 300 million sits there. Instruments, kits, and services just for pathogen testing. So then you have to ask, how's this thing growing? Well, the growth in the developed countries is about 8%, but in Asia Pacific, it's growing at almost 20%. This is driven by the growth of the middle class, uh, the fact that those folks are making lots of money, and they want better water. So when you put that all together, we're getting about an average of a 9% growth 
So that $300 million market that my company's going out of there, by 2019, will be almost $600 million. The technical trends that we're also talking about has to do with how things are tested. So right now, 95% of the water pathogen tests, so 95% of that 300 million, they're using petri dish sort of testing. Very simplistic testing, that's low cost, takes 18 to 24 hours, and if it's 95, then 5% left over these emerging pathogens. What's going on with the regulatory agencies, EPA is a good example, and the same with the EU, is they're demanding more and more emerging pathogen tests. So by the time you get to 2019, um, the, the, it's going to be shifting more towards the, the more complex testing. And by the way, the customer we've got is, is the guy on the Hathaway. So let's talk about, again, who these, who these customers are. So water, water is one of those invisible things. Uh, having grown up in, in, in California, you turn the tap, the water comes out. Um, there's 150,000 uh, water agencies, uh, community water agencies, and they're the folks that are spending about $140 million in the U.S. As we look at the business that we're getting into, we actually focus down onto uh, about 85% of the business, which, which is about 9,000 of these water agencies. If you then drill down into that number, uh, and if you're going to start a business, you're going to have to do this. Uh, from a business standpoint, you get one who are the customers. There's about 6,000 labs. Um, um, so you got 5,000 of them are inside the government, and 1,000 of them are private. The reason to, to break that out is that the drivers for those two sets are different. The, the government labs that are, that are now running these low tech tests, for them, they're getting lots and lots of pressure on time to answer. In fact, there are our competitors out there, IDEX and Hawk, they're making a big buck and competing on the fact that their test isn't 24 hours or 20 hours or 16 hours. So getting the 24 down is a big deal in this marketplace. Now if you look at the private labs, the private labs are getting the majority of these complex tests. So if you can walk into a lab that's doing a crypto already test and they're paying $600 for it and we happen to know it takes $350 bucks that, that, that kit, if we can sell it to them cheaper we can drive our business in. Um, I'm not going to go into all this detail about emerging pathogens, but there's a great deal of, of literature on emerging pathogens, different types of emerging pathogens. Um, my favorite is the uh, brain-eating one um, that uh, has been found in Louisiana. Again, what's happened here is you look at the news. Uh, last month, the, the city of New York um, opened up a $1.4 billion uh, UV treatment plant for just treatment, treating the crypto area. Okay, so you guys are all engineers, I suspect, and scientists, so let's get in, in, into what we're talking about. So what we're talking about is a disk, a reagent kit, and an analyzer. So um, the technology that I've licensed is working here and spinning this a little hard out. You've got the disks. What we'll be building is a system like this, but it'll also be a system that each one of these boxes will have a GM chip in it, a GCM chip in it, such that all the data goes up in the cloud and we'll be able to make that data available to our customers, not only to manage the data, locate the data, but also to use it as a sales portal. Um, when you look at the drivers that our, our customers are, are seeing, um, we then break it into kind of two sets. Um, again, where the business is. So what's called total coal, coal farm and E. coli, this is the old tech, they're running 15 to 35 dollars, 18 to 24 hours, is the actual test. So if you get on the phone and you want, you got a water sample, you want that test run, that's what you'll pay for it at the lab. If you do it privately, you gotta ship the sample. If they're doing it inside the water agencies, they've got that much time. We'll be able to compete uh, with these guys because we're gonna have a disc that'll do four tests, and we'll do it in three hours. That's what our, our, our business plan calls for. If you look at the other driver, rather than time to answer, which is which is low kit costs and low labor, the crypto sporting yard, as I mentioned, is 650. Three to five days, actually. Um, our research has shown that we're putting about 20 hours of labor in this. It's very complex. And they've got about 350 a kit. And they've got a microbiologist. 
in our case, we have a $15,000 analyzer. Uh, it'll be about $175 a kit, and we've got about three hours uh, time to answer, about two hours of labor, and in our case, it'll be using a trained technician rather than a microbiologist. A little more depth into exactly how we do this. This is a technical arbitrage in the sense that this is immunoassay. And an immunoassay uh, is bead-based, and as I go into it, any of you with any molecular bi biology background will certainly understand how it works. The difficulty is it gets down to the picomolar range, <coughs> and the actual sensitivity you need in a water test is about four logs below that. So what we've done is we've also been working with a company, uh, Scientific Methods. They've got, again, they've got an old technology, they've got some, I, they've got some IP out of, out of the University of Notre Dame that allows them to concentrate water samples. So they can concentrate five liters down, they can do about a 10 to the fourth concentration of sample. So by doing the 10 to the fourth concentration of sample, and us having immunoassay data from Sandia Labs, we're able to hit our uh, goals. Because it's technology, let's dig really deep. So what's going on in there is that you've got, um, you've got these bead-based assays. So think about it for us non-molecular biology people. Think about it that I've got, uh, I've got, with, I've got a, a Y-shaped thing that's going to grab a hold of E. coli. I've got the other side of that, that puppy that I've got to a, to a bead. And these are beads that are very standard in magnetic-based bead assays. But in our case, there's no magnet. They're just the same size. So now I've got those two things floating around in reaction. I've got that at the center of, of this wheel. I rock it back and forth. I rock it back and forth. It's mixing. So now what happens is, is, is a sandwich closes up. The E. coli that I'm looking for, and only the E. coli, e. coli that I'm looking for, gets anchored to the bead. And when it gets anchored, it also has a fluorophore with it. I then turn this thing up to high RPM. So now what I'm doing is I'm spinning this thing. I've got my irradiations. I've got my density media. What's happening, as it shows across the top, is that now these beads hit a wall. It's a soft wall. It's a, it's a wall that, if you will, is kind of like wax. So as you spin it up, the beads get moved out to the outside. Well, the advantage from a point of care diagnostic standpoint is that all of my onbound marker, all of the E. coli I don't want to have anything to do with, all the background nasty sample poop that they always went into, it's all sitting back up there. So now, when I do a fluorescent analysis of that set of beads down the bottom, I just got what I'm looking for. It's low cost, it's simple, got great shelf life, and it uses existing assays that I can, I can buy right off the phone. Beyond that, the technology has been demonstrated to work in a variety of assay formats. So what I just described, the one that I just described, the, the classic immunoassay, uh, ELISA-based protein, it's very simple assay. Yes, we can do that. The other advantage of this platform is that reaction zone in the disk, we can take a look at um, we can take a look at different kinds of assays. We can do, look, we can do a gene hybridization assay, right? Easily. Um, they've even actually done isothermal PCR on that zone. So the platform itself will do the test that we're going to sell to our customers and get going, but we have a great deal of depth so that if we need to be able to look at different types of assays, we can. So what's the history and what's the IP? Uh, Sandia National Laboratories started about four years ago with a series of federal grants um, pointed them towards uh, a blood test. This is for a dirty bomb blood test. So they wanted a system that would go into ambulances, uh, a system that would need a minimum amount of training, and they achieved that goal, um, and then they turned to out licensing it to medical diagnostics. So their focus was to get to where they could hand it off to the Department of Homeland Security and the DOD. The DOD's got theirs, Department of Homeland Security starts in January with their trial. Um, they just got another four million of NIH money on the same program. So as they move forward, we own licenses, exclusive license to the technology for waterborne pathogen as they stack up more IP. Um, and it also gives us the opportunity to stack our own ideas on top of that. Um, there are some aspects to the reagent disk integration and the ASTA analytics that ties into my own background and several companies that I've done that we think we can add our own IP. 
So we have exclusive access. Uh, it's an active ongoing program. They've already put $4 million into it, and they're putting more money into it, and they're, and they're uh, adding more patents. For a relatively small amount of money, I was able to license that technology. So again, competitive landscape, we've said this before, but since it's part of my business pitch, we'll say it again, is that right now what they're doing is they're, they're doing these PP dishes. The other thing they're doing is they're trying to use PCR type, type systems. They've got some um, BioFire, Paul, uh, IDEX, Hawk. these guys have got basically systems down, down using PCR. The difficulty is even, even the simplest ones they come up with, the capitals are very expensive at 50K and they need advanced training. Our system, as I've mentioned, is, is low cost and simple. Um, I think I've gone into the basic defensive pieces of it. It's scalable, it's, it's uh, we got all the patents in place. Um, so our marketing strategy is to go out after the 95%. So the 95% means that we've got to go after TCR. Um, Parallel to that, we're also going into emerging pathogens. So the idea is to get into the labs with the PCR. Our boxes are relatively cheap. The 15,000 um, price is very conservative. Um, once I have the actual numbers in my hand, I think we'll lower the price of the box some. The point is to get the boxes in as fast as we can. The idea there is to get the boxes in so they can do the coliform testing and then we can sell them um, more of the emerging technology. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to target uh, the treatment boom that I mentioned earlier, and that's out in, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, I had an opportunity in 06 to set up a, a joint venture for a medical device company that we licensed in the Singapore uh, manufacturing in Malaysia. So I've had some experience in that area, and I've got some contacts there. Um, not so much that we have dazzling finances, uh, which we do, but the purple lines, I think something that the people I've talked to before this meeting that are putting together companies and driving things in, one of the things when you review a company, and you, if I've survived this far in presentation, they ask you how far you're penetrating. You say, great, I've got this market. Great, I'm penetrating 50% in two years. And then they quit talking to you. Because nobody ever gets that much of the competition in two years. So if you notice what we've got is even though we're at 35 million, we're only about 7% penetration. It's a big market and we can make money at this without taking a big piece of it. Um, part of the reason I'm here is to look for interns to start working for us as we set the company up and, and team is, is what's, what's, what really is important. In my case, though I've had the technical background um, and set the manufacturing up uh, and been the CEO at some startups and gone commercial several times. Um, one of the key pieces of my background, other than all those bits and pieces, which means I can get the job done, it is that I've been through uh, two acquisitions. Sold a company back from Coulter, and in 2009 sold another company. Co-founder is a sales and marketing guy with 20 years of experience in this marketplace. Um, great context of the EPA, American Water, all the different competitors. He's, he's outstanding. But also, he's had experience in acquisitions. Uh, he sold a piece of the company he was in in 2012 to Modern Water. So when I try to pitch to investors, you try to get their money, they actually want the money back. And they want the money back multiplied times, 5 or 10x. So what I say to them is we both have experience in doing acquisitions. That way, they have some hope they get their money back. Um, the other thing is, is, is advisors and partnerships. So I've talked about Sandia National Labs. Uh, one of the guys, groups in here, knows the guys at Sandstone. So Sandstone uh, are the guys that spun out of Sandia. Great guys. Uh, we've got an MOU with them. Scientific Methods does the sample concentration for us. Just signed a lease at QB3 at 953. Awesome place, good pricing. Uh, Connie Sheppel is a customer and very senior and one of our advisors. Um, Actually, Eric uh, at the EPA is the reason I'm here because Eric introduced me to uh, Charlotte Smith and introduced me to Kevin, which got me here. Um, Peter Freeman's our financial wizard and got us in front of Karitsu. Uh, John has got the legal background in environmental. Uh, Michael Seabree is our lawyer in Oakland, worth every thousand um, dollars. And Craig Martin is the Karitsu guy. 
I think that should be it. That's it. Can I answer questions? Excuse me? What's your IP status in the development world? IP status of? Yeah, so is it patented in China and you know, Asia Pacific or? What's my IP status in P PCTs or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they haven't filed them. Good question. So that's a problem with some of the, the federal labs is they haven't filed any PCTs. So we have to file the PCTs. Uh, so we're not going there until we do. I think that this business is, uh, there's going to be enough know-how in the reagents. Trade secrets are forever. Mm -hmm. Patents are short. <laughs> so I mean, we're, we're also just kind of understanding the know-how. Um, having dealt with uh, micro microfluidic IP in Singapore and in Shenzhen, you should be very, very careful. But that's a very good question. And the, and the PCDs haven't found yet. The problem is there's seven. So it's. What kind of regulatory hoops are there to jump through in terms of getting these assays from you know something that works the paper? Excellent or question. Here to. Ex excellent question. The uh, break it. Well, there it goes. Let me just put up a slide that makes more fun than that slide. Um, that one's cool. Um, it's the EPA. Right, so uh, one of, why am I doing this? I got tired of the FDA. So the EPA is different. I mean, it's similar to the CPR. You write a test plan, you get three labs to run the data. Our friend of the EPA is supplies the water samples blind. Um, the other advantage, though, is you don't have to have EPA approval to use it. So if uh, in the US, the big cities, yeah. But if we want to sell it in other places, Canada, uh, they want the data. So there's some advantages there. Um, we have 18 months in our, in our plan right now for the EPA. <clears throat> We've had two good meetings with the folks who run that, and we're looking, they have an uh, accelerated program we're trying to get into and cut it down to one. So I'm wondering how reasonable it is to want, let's say, five liter as you know, the sample size that you need to get a concentration pack you need to get these very good question. Um, the five liters has to do with the concentration factor, right? So if you're on sub, <clears throat> where millions of liters are going by, five liters is a pump, and, and it's we quote three. It's actually like an hour, so you're pumping it just through the filters, right? If you use an outside lab, there's labs around here. Call them up for a, that test. You you, you send them 150 50 milliliters. If I'm doing a media-based test, I add media and I heat up to 40 degrees Celsius and I wait 24 hours. That's the reason you don't need five liters. But in our case, um, we have a rock-solid approach just by filtering. And also, the CryptoGiardia protocol, which has got, got through, it's been out of the EPA for a couple of years now, since 05, uses concentration. So it's, it's not like a new idea. The government's still there. I understand it's licensed exclusively by you for water testing? Waterborne pathogens. Waterborne pathogens. So someone who has this technology, would they be allowed to use it to test, say, some diarrhea sample or something? To test what? To test some other non-water sample. Or would they, are, they, have to sign, have to, are they excluded from testing urine or something else? You make me think through 12 pages of licensing documents. Um, um, again, if, if somebody buys a pregnancy test and starts using it on something else, you know, the guy who makes the test isn't responsible for how they use it, right? In our case, there's a GSM chip going to go in every box, and unless I get told no, we'll have all the data. So if we start getting weird stuff off, off the box, we'll know it. But it, it doesn't impact our license. So uh, I don't think we have we, we could control that. Is your point that they could use it for other things? Yeah, I was just curious how that might play out. Whether they have to. Well, we realize you're getting a reagent kit, right? 
And the Sandia Lab says that the disk is agnostic, that once you get one profile shape, you don't know, change it. It hasn't been proven to me yet. So you also get reagents, right? So for them to do something other than the antibody, I mean, other than, so they're looking at, at, at a virus, a pathogen, a cyst or something, they have to have the reagent kit. So, and the spin protocol, and the read protocol. And we're going to link it so that when you load it, it's going to know which kit went in. You have to know that, right? It's going to know which samples on which, which uh, spoke. You have to know that. And it's going to know which reagent kit went in. So, what you're suggesting is, I wouldn't say impossible, but someone's got to hand, hand make their own feed based reagent. Oh, I actually bent. Could you test for a waterborne pathogen that's not in water? In, I mean, is that allowed by the license? Out on a limb, and uh, though I have many friends, microbiologists, I am not one. Again, the reaction kit's going to be looking at a, a certain amount of water. You've got buffers in there. Um, so it's, it's not as if somebody couldn't put anything in there, right? And run the reaction, our reaction kit in it. Right? Um, food safety, all kinds of different things. It's not as if they couldn't do that. But if they then bring that data out and say, I'm testing this with this thing and it says that, we would be the first ones to say, no, it's not. Right? Because, you know, if, we, if, if they start saying that they're testing, I have data, for example, E. coli 0157 from Sandy National Laboratories in milk. Right? If somebody starts using this thing testing milk and using our reagents and our kits and everything and starts using that data, we or our lawyer in Oakland would write them a letter saying we do not stand behind any of that data. But no, I mean, you can't. I mean, certain aspects of what we're doing with linking all, we want to be able, I'm running this thing like a megabyte, so we're linking auditing together, but nothing could. There's IP for the concentration. Yeah. Yes. So, like, it is through, um, like, the surface antigen recognition or the concentration. No, the IP process. The actual property on the disk and the and the uh, analyzer has to do with the sedimentation has to do with the centrifugal sedimentation, it has to do uh, with how they pull the, the beads out of the reaction. Yeah. It doesn't have to do with what assay it is. It has to do with the fact that I've got a functionalized bead, right? Mm -hmm. Drop it in a reaction. It grabs a whole certain analyze based on its functionality. I then spin up the RPM and shove that bead through a wall of goop and read it. So, so though they've got that in, they've got some you know, actually, inside the IP, it's not in the claims. But I thought you said the concentration process is the front end pro process. The, the front end pro uh, the concentration process yeah. is commercial. So we're buying a box with a with a disposable inside. They have their own IP. I don't have a license to that. And what they do is it's a special uh, continuous centrifugal filtering, and they functionalized the. Uh, I've read their patent. They functionalized aspects to the filter media uh, to better release consistently all of all the uh, pathogens or parasites that are but that's a separate company uh, we've been offered a, a license to it but at the moment it, it, we just buy it but again technical arbitrage says you find things and glue them together it doesn't mean you have to own them all you're just the first one to find them in our case it doesn't mean much if you have that, unless you have that. Hang on, you have the second question. This is her first question. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so I don't think I've quite understood how you analyze how much uh, pathogen you have. Sure. So you do the sedimentation. So they bind to the antibodies, but then you get sedimentation. Yeah, you know, I switched to it. But this slide's not as good as the other one. Hang on, I'll show you. 
Um, Is it quantify or do you just say yes or no? So, you quantify. So, um, um, so what you're saying is, is that I've, I've, got a, I've got a reaction sitting there, right? So I've, I've got, think about it very simple, that I've got this shape and the centrifugal force is in this direction, right? So I've got I've got a media that's sitting in here. All this is full of media, right? I've got my reaction sitting out here. So I've got you know I've got my uh, my antibody grabbing the guy, I've got my hair over on the bead, right? So with this is a fluorophore, and again okay, the cartridge's not right, but the fluorophore is attached, right? So now what I end up with is I now end up after I run my protocol, I end up with a package coming down. This is in the literature, right? Only the beads end up down there. Only the beads are functional ones. I then hit it with the right waving light. I march off to one side of the soak ship and I'm entering. So the fluorophore is bound to the pathogen, though, right? It's, it's an antibody sandwich. There's different ways of doing okay. that. Sometimes the fluorophore gets bound when it comes together. So you end up with extra 404, extra antibodies, and all kinds of stuff up here. And this is the reason why it's patented, mm -hmm. is that all the stuff that you usually end up in an assay, if you're doing a magnetic-based assay, the reason it's magnetic is these beads get stuck to the side of the test tube, and you wash out all the bad stuff. And speaking as a mechanical engineer, so I'm not a biologist or an organic chemist, but you end up with each one of these beads having the fluorophore on it, and a very predictable amount such that it's proportional. So if, if, if the light coming off the beads is 6, I can calibrate it to say how much analyte was in that sample up here. Okay. And that's, there's lots of data on that, good CVs, good sensitivities, all that sort of stuff. So the, the, they've been doing it for four years. But won't they um, sediment even if they don't have the pathogen bound? What? what? Would it just be sediment anyway, even if they don't have the pathogen bound? No, this isn't sedimentation like mud in a, in a glass of water. Wrong metaphor. Or, you know, something in a glass of water. This is sedimentation where when you start spinning it, right, you're right spinning. the ball hits hits the wax. It only moves because you're spinning it. You stop spinning, the ball, the ball, ball doesn't go. You're creating a, uh, a force, centrifugal force. Right, yeah. Right? So if you... And you have to spin fast enough. If you don't spin too fast, the ball won't go all the way. So part of what they've patented is, is the RPMs and everything. So you spin this thing up to very high RPMs. I can run it again. It spins up quite fast, right? So you spin it up, spin it up, spin it up. And what you've done is, if you've done the physics, you know how much the pellets weigh. These pellets are commoditized. They're, they're common in all assets. Assay formats, so you get these pellets. They're very, very, very consistent. So the, the, the variation in the weight, the diameter of that pellet is, is, is out to the parts of, you know, a little percentage. The functionalization of the surface is well known. The, 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 the fluorophore is on the surface with the binding of the, to the antibodies. It's been around since the 70s. Yeah, I was just curious. I also work with those types of beads. Hi. Yeah, so I was just curious. <laughs> Good question. Okay. What, what's the uh, diameter of the magnetic beads you're using? It's pretty that. Um, I think like two micron beads. Okay. Two microns. And I actually think we've got a range in there. It's I think one to three. I don't know. Um, we're about ready, when I get the interns in, we're about ready to take a whole data download out of Sandy with that's all that. And, and the, pro the protocol for the RPMs, uh, and the protocol for the material that's in the sedimentation. It's, again, all that's off the shelf. Wait a minute, you're first. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Oh, um, the number of comparing prices um, between the competition and the Aren't 
Good question. Um, at the moment, it looks like though the antibodies are expensive, we're using such a small amount in the kit. Um, we still think our kit price falls in the category I'm talking about. Um, realize PCR is just multiplication. So you can do media to get the number up. You can filter a bunch of stuff down to get the number up. You do PCR. You still have to do. You have to still have to use the antibody to get, get the assay. Now, hybridization assay is different. But the reagents and the hybridization assays are pretty expensive. The DNA sort of hybridization assays are very expensive reagents. Um, I haven't looked into that. My suspicion is that I shall visit South Asia for my antibodies. Yeah, I was just wondering, I do like primary and antibody screening, and they're relatively very Oh, they're really expensive, yeah. yeah. But you're, you're talking about time amounts. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious how you became involved with the SpinDX system. I know a lot of us here are you know, engineers, grad students, and so we kind of think that what we work on in you know, grad school would be, you know, if we develop something, that would be the product we pursue. Uh, so I'm wondering how you kind of... Uh, well, I was in grad school here. It was the 70s. Um, uh, it was just as cool as you think. Um, um, think. Um, what I, you know, I end up working my as an engineer and then, you know, uh, wearing my suit more than anything else. But then uh, I think I mentioned about um, after Clara Biosciences, I had an opportunity to go back to, to small companies under 20 people. So I just, just decided to go do that. And I was fortunate enough, this is the third one uh, that, we're that I've still made enough money uh, to pay the bills. Um, I, I do think, though, that. Uh, Maybe it's a different question that uh, how do engineers become business people? You, that's an interesting um, question. You know, I, I, I think it's part of that is um, part of that. Um, my wife made a Google Maps work. Um, <laughs> part of that is um, part of that is is, is having mentors. Um, and I, I've been fortunate that some of the mentors in my career, uh, I got the job done to make them money running the companies, and they helped me understand some of the mechanics of what we're talking about. Um, uh, partnerships, I think, are important. Um, but I think between the partnerships and, and the mentoring that I've gotten uh, has, has been able to get me to the point where uh, I've been able to pitch it. Um, I think the other thing is, is go out and talk to actually talk to the customer. I used to make a living building prototypes. Uh, my first real job after after grad school, because I basically got through grad school building prototypes of the LVL and stuff I partly understood. Um, data trumps theory. People want so. I would say that that, that that thesis, which is data, build a prototype piece of data versus somebody who's really articulate on the theory. I'm always the one that's not that articulate, so I make prototypes with data. So data trumps theory. Talking to a customer trumps even the best MBA analysis. So, so get in front of customers and tell them that's your idea. Find one that, that really is in you. Better yet, find several that really believe in you. And then I think if you find that, then you may have a, have a market. So when it comes to a lot of waterborne diseases, like ultimately the goal is to prevent waterborne pathogens from transmitting and stuff. Um, so what's the, the, to be prevention or? Yeah, well, um, I guess when it comes to diagnostics, does your diagnostic test make the distinction between the different Pathogens, as opposed to just all around assessing whether or not there is a waterborne pathogen. Because you said cryptogyria, but I wasn't sure if that meant that you made the distinction Sorry. between. The cryptogyria, sorry. The, the... So, I guess my question is does your diagnostic make the distinction between the different types of pathogens? Yes, yes. The, one of the advantages of this technology is it's physically multiplied. So you have a different pathogen in every spoke of the wheel, and there's 30 spokes. So as we went through before, the reagent 
is specific to a particular pathogen, right? So um, a lot of medical diagnostics in hospitals, they'll run, the, they'll run five pathogens in one reaction, and then they have different colors they look at. They have different ways of doing that. We run a single pathogen per, per, per uh, spoke. So um, the EPA and the WHO are going towards a list of about eight of them that we can run easily. Um, how many of those tests are you doing for E. coli? Are you just planning on doing one, or are you planning on doing multiple doses of different classes of E. coli? Very good question. Uh, um, you mentioned, you, so what I saw was there, there are, these labs are doing 500,000 uh, TCRs a month, right? So uh, we can't compete unless we do multiple tests. So our goal was, was to set up a disk and we'll do four at a time. Four single samples at a time. Um, one of the things we we've got to be able to do is lots and lots of tests. <coughs> at the same time, using uh, image-based measurement and using the computer to keep track of samples, try to lower the labor. Um, not, a, not a touch time. Was that it? Did you want to? I was asking if you're using different amino acids for E. coli, not multiple samples. So, for example, my research environmentally occurring E. coli that are producing false positives on these tests for E. coli, and whether these amino acids can distinguish those. Very good question. We should talk more. Uh, yeah, you got a problem with this assay. It's, it's structural. So it, can it may count in E. coli that are dead, right? Specificity of the antibody pairing is, is a question, right? Um, the hybridization assays, there's some arguments that those are better. Um, that's, I think, again, I'd love to talk more about that. Part of you have to do is you have to put that in context of what they're now doing. They're doing colorimetric assays. If it turns blue five times out of seven or whatever, then they've got to, they've got to make some change. They have to do more testing. So our, we're planning on getting in with uh, 0157 antibody pairs that have been um, accepted already uh, by the EPA. But I think beyond that, um, the core of the company is going to become an asset development uh, technology. I mean, guys like me, the gadget guys, are really not that important. It's going to be the asset. So I, the, the question you brought up, I think, is pretty much endless, really, uh, which is specificity. Did I get that right? Yeah, I mean, it is a, kind of one of the major shortcomings I am too. Um, so this is sort of more philosophical questions. Are there, so as engineers here, we're all sort of passionate about the technology we help develop, you know, that we work on. So from your standpoint, is there any, you know, I guess, what are your, you know, maybe selection criteria or any trepidation you have, you know, starting a company based on a technology that, you know, you were not part of the development of? I haven't, um, I haven't really put myself onto something that I invented for over a decade and a half. So no, no. I think the other thing about uh, Eagle is especially know what I can't do. I'm, I'm not that good at the at, at, uh, what our friends good at. I'm not good at, I'm really not that good at the inventing part. That's the reason I went into operations. You know, those those who can. I mean, those can, what's the thing about the, all the bad jokes about manufacturing guys? Uh, but that turned out to be better for me. I was better at it. So, no, I, I'm more concerned that I, I've got a customer, multiple customers, that are telling me they, they really need something. And then what they really need, the technology fits. Um, other thing is it's easier for me to kill it if it's not mine. And sometimes you, you have to you know, move away from something. I mean, you have to... It, um, the question was brought up with specificity. If, if we have a trouble with the E. coli and we have to go over to Legionella, for example, I'm the one that's going to make that decision. And if, if it's yours, that's fine. Yeah, so uh, going back to the question of specificity, uh, 
a gadget is really cool. Even if it works perfectly, your test is only as good as your reagents. So um, can you just address, just strategically or more generally speaking, your company's plan for um, reagent development? Is that going to be held in-house? Or what are mechanisms for quality control that you might have around your suppliers? I think to make the business viable, it's not in sight. Um, I have I built a business with inside start with Genentech, and we made uh, gene expression kits in-house. Uh, it's it's hard to make any money out of it because um, of scale. Our business was a couple million dollars a year, so it's better to find uh, outside manufacturing as a rule. Um, quality control on. Uh, different types of assays. There are traditional uh, quality control that's used. If, if different, I'm better than background as well than I. But if, if, if you've got, you go to a, go to a basically some kind of set up, uh, like sciences company set up for what you put for a base assay. They've got traditional controls. There's ways to measure specificity and all that sort of stuff. So you have traditional controls. I think the other thing is you put in your own um, Actual test. So, if, if, if in our case we've got 30 uh, spokes, it's always good to run control standards in there, right? It's okay occasionally to say error and, and pull the data out of a run. It's not, you do not want to start having false positives or false negatives, meaning that you can also, um, you can also calibrate your own system by putting in standards. A lot of medical equipment re is required to be standardized once a year. You sell them standards and standardize the assays they run. Have you guys tried to use uh, LSPR instead of immunofluorescence to do uh, localized surface plasma and resonance? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you could. Um, that's another hunk of technology though. Cost of the tech, but yes, I guess you could if you set the beats up right. Okay, but I don't know much about that tech. Excuse. Think we're anybody else? Oh, also, um, what like? To get the antigens, are you lysing the cells, or are you doing anything special to the um, like bacteria? Or the beauty of the water testing is you don't have to, you don't have to license cells because the, the E. coli are floating around in there, right? If if you're um, if you're doing the DNA testing, you're licensing. And this thing's, we're trying to come out with something that's very simple from an assay standpoint. So we can get a simple bead-based amino assay, ELISA sort of thing, then you then straight ahead. If not, then I've got, I've got more agents. And you've got, uh, you've got storage, you've got shipment. So you've got some other sorts of problems if the reagents get more complex. So you've got more quality control. You're mostly detecting the surface receptors then of the uh, E. coli or? Could. Um, again, technical arbitrage says it works right now. We go out with what we got and get, get some money, to get some customers close to us, and then we've got flexibility. Okay. Uh, I mean, I was just curious, like, what? Oh, I just don't, I don't know. There you go. Okay. All right, well, thanks, everybody, for your time.